Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds 2024. Uh, my name is Rebecca Muley, and I'm one of the incoming Grand Rounds uh, directors, along with Drs. Adi Talati and Alex Harris. Uh, we have a few announcements before we begin today. Next week's Grand Rounds presentation will be on Wednesday, January 17th, and will be a special Grand Rounds presented by the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. The speaker will be Lisa Fortuna, the professor and chair of psychiatry and neurosciences at UC Riverside School of Medicine, and she'll be giving a talk entitled From Stigma to Strength, Exploring the Role of Discrimination and Belonging in Mental Health Research. Uh, and then we'd also like to give a big shout out and a, a lot of thank yous to Drs. Jeffrey Miller, Christine Denny, and Kate Elkington for their work over the last several years. Uh, I think it felt like decades moderating Grand Rounds. Uh, we have a number of uh, uh, big shoes to step into, and I think that we are starting strong because of all of the work that you three have done to build the Grand Rounds into uh, something that is more sustainable, more educational, more exciting, and we're hoping to fulfill that promise looking forward. And so if Melissa can come up. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Melissa Arbuckle, the Vice Chair for Education, and I really wanted to take this moment to celebrate the changing of the guard for our Grand Rounds co-directors. Um, as of this month, we have three new co-directors, um, and I'm really looking forward to working with all of you in your, in your new roles. At the same time, we really wanted to appropriately extend our gratitude to our three outgoing co-directors, Dr. Denny, Dr. Elkington and Dr. Miller. They have really worked tirelessly behind the scenes to bring us a fabulous lineup of speakers. Through this series, they've helped us advance our understanding, ranging from latest experience experiments going on in basic neuroscience to policy and implementation science. They've helped us keep up to date with the latest advances in clinical practice. And over the past two years, they've also brought us back together from being entirely virtual to this new hybrid format, providing spaces for us to come together in person as a community, seamlessly doing this hybrid thing where they engage both an online audience um, and the in-person attendees. Uh, it's been really beautiful to watch. And they've also advocated for bringing back our trainee lunch to have a special opportunity to meet with speakers and to continue the conversation. So I want to personally thank them for sharing their expertise with us. And, and in gratitude for the time they have shared with us, we are pleased to present them with an engraved clock um, as a thank you on behalf of the department. So please join me in thanking our out outgoing Grand Rounds co-directors, Christine Denny, Kate Elkington, and Jeff Miller. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So, thank you. Should we? Should we do? We, why don't we, we do it? Kate, we'll do it at the end. We'll, the end. The we'll end. grab. We'll grab her at the end. We'll just can't leave her out. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I will turn it back over. So for those who may not have seen that, uh, we have some uh, plaques with a, a very beautiful clock in the center as a gift of thanks to our three uh, outgoing co-directors. Uh, and so now um, we'll go ahead and introduce the uh, speakers for today. Um, I do want to, uh, before that, just encourage you to, uh, for those of you joining remotely, uh, definitely, we pay attention closely to the Q&A, and so if you do have a, a thought or a question along the way and you would like to jot it down, please do so. If you can uh, ask the question yourself, we can actually make you a panelist, so you have that opportunity to do that, or you can say wish to ask it anonymously. Uh, we also strongly encourage trainees. We like to have a trainee question go first or second. And especially those trainees in the audience as well, if you can just pop your hand up um, when I ask for any trainee questions, we'd love to have more trainee involvement. Um, and so in addition, um, we 
uh, want to encourage everybody to do as much reach out as they can just to foster a sense of connection. And if we don't get to your questions, we can always connect you with the speakers afterwards. Uh, so it is a very uh, great privilege of mine to host this first Grand Rounds for our co-directorship. Uh, and it is going to be part of our clinical update series, uh, which is designed to hear from faculty in our department about the latest developments in clinical care in the topic area. Today's session is devoted to the assessment and treatment of school avoidance and will be given jointly by Drs. Anne-Marie Albano and Tony Puliafico. Dr. Albano is the Columbia University Clinic for Anxiety and Related Disorders, aka QCARD, Professor of Medical Psychology and Psychiatry. She received her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Mississippi, and she is a fellow of the American Psychological Association, or APA, and of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, ABCT, of which she has also served as president for both of those organizations. She is also a founding fellow of the Academy of Cognitive Therapy and a founding editor of the Journal of Evidence-Based Practice in Child and Adolescent Mental Health, and she served as editor for many other journals. And additionally, she was the principal, one of the principal investigators for the NIMH-funded Child Adolescent Anxiety Multimodal Treatment Study, or CAMS, and of the Treatment for Adolescents with Depression Study, or TADS, uh, as well as their follow-up studies. Dr. Albano has published over 200 articles and chapters with her co-authors, and she is the co-author of several cognitive behavioral treatment manuals, as well as the child and parent versions of the Anxiety Disorders Interview Schedule for the DSM-5. She is also a mentor, teacher, and supervisor to child psychiatry fellows, clinical psychology students and fellows, and to audiences of clinicians and academics from the range of mental health professions. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Poliafico as well. Poliafico as well. Uh, he's an associate professor of clinical psychology in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Columbia University. He serves as the director of the uh, QCARD Westchester Clinic. Uh, which is an outpatient clinic in CUIMC's Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Division that specializes in the treatment of anxiety disorders, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, and related disorders in children, adolescents, and adults. I have so many questions for you already. <laughs> uh, so he also directs QCARD Westchester's Anxiety Day Program, an intensive treatment program for adolescents with anxiety, OCD, and school avoidance, and he currently serves as interim clinical director of QCARD's Manhattan office. Dr. Puliafico's clinical and scholarly work have focused on the treatment of pediatric OCD, school avoidance, and adapting treatments for young children with anxiety. Uh, Dr. Puliafico has a strong interest in partnering with schools and community agencies to address student anxiety and school avoidance, and regularly presents to and consults with schools and agencies throughout the tri-state region. He co-developed the COM program, an adaptation of PCIT for young children with anxiety, and is the co-director of the, oh, sorry, co-author of the OCD workbook for kids. Uh, wow, so I'm very much looking forward to this presentation. Uh, clearly you guys are rock stars in the field, so come on up. Well, what do you say, Tony? We just go home now, that, that's all we needed. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, I have to say, the first time that I came to give Grand Rounds was in the, the fall of 1998 when I moved to New York City and David Schaffer invited me to do a rounds here. And uh, it didn't take long after that for me to decide I needed to move here uh, to Columbia. And so I wanna thank all of you on the committees, uh, the old and new, um, for inviting us to do this rounds. And actually, Tony, we've shared the stage before for rounds a couple of years back. That's right. Yeah. Maybe 10 PCIT. years ago, yeah. PCIT. So let's go with school refusal. So thank you for being here. Just disclosures for the two of us. We get pizza every year with our honoraria. <laughs> Going to talk. Yeah. So, you know, the idea for today is to really to, to give an overview of how we're defining school avoidance, what our understanding is of school avoidance. Dr. Abana will run through you know, latest research in terms of our understandings and treatment interventions. We then very much want to focus on, you know, how we think about school avoidance from a systems level and how that really incorporates into, uh, you know, the clinical work that we're doing, you know, on a therapy, on a, on a medication and on kind of a, a more global level. So that's our plan for today. Um, and then looking forward to talking and discussing a lot during the Q&A as well. So let's just start with school avoidance behavior, which actually is a new term. 
for those of us in the audience who graduated high school in the 70s and before, uh, you might remember school phobia. The old term was school phobia. That was the term that was used through the 50s and 60s into the 70s. And over time, that morphed into school refusal behavior because actually school phobia sort of indicated that the kid was afraid of school or something fearful about school, and it really didn't capture the picture well. School refusal behavior is what stood for many years, thanks to Chris Carney, who we'll refer to uh, here and there through this talk. And school refusal behavior actually has come to be understood as, you know, they're not willfully refusing school. When we talk about the kids that we mainly serve in anxiety and depression clinics, uh, for the most part, what's happening is there's a motivating condition that has a byproduct of school avoidance. So school avoidance really captures much more about these kids who have difficulty with attending and staying in school, either part of the day in class or fully attending school day after day. So it relates to problems with adaptive coping, getting used to things, settling in, and so forth. Okay, so school avoidance behavior is the new terminology over the last maybe two to three years. When it comes to school avoidance behavior, then let's bear in mind there is school withdrawal, which is where a parent or caretaker keeps a child home. And you see this in families where they keep a child home to care for other family members or the parent who can't manage things, or there's other kinds of disruptions that they're keeping the child home willfully. That is different. We also know truancy. We're not necessarily here talking about kids who are truant with conduct um, and oppositional behaviors, defiance on the externalizing realm. We're really looking at our kids who are more of the internalizing kids who are avoidant of school, again, because of some condition that's motivating them. That being said, um, is this working? This is not working. Just to add there, um, because a lot of folks who we work with, a lot of kids who we work with, their anxiety does really present as acting out, as externalizing, what looks like truancy or cutting behavior. There might be substance abuse or what have you. And it's careful. It's working now. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, so we always want to carefully assess for the functions of those more, more externalizing behaviors to make sure that we're not just kind of labeling a kid as an oppositional kid or a kid who just doesn't care. Oftentimes there is an anxiety or depression underlying there that isn't necessarily uh, seen up front. And then of course, what we see when we're thinking about school avoidance, we're looking at significant impairment that results from missing many days of school that leads to academic failure, or falling behind in many ways, Conflict is everywhere and maybe with the parents, but also between the parents and the schools. A lot of things could happen in terms of conflict. And then what you see are different kinds of ways of trying to get kids in or get the family to motivate them in, including law enforcement and the courts getting involved. There's a number of, th number of things that happen there. And a big thing that we've been studying over the last uh, decade is the way that developmental progress, just meeting developmental milestones, really gets upended when kids are not in school. The levels of school avoidance, and this was characterized mostly by Chris Carney, um, was number one, there's self-corrective school avoidance. I mean, how many of us like getting up in the morning and going on a Monday to work, never mind going to school, but you know, the beginning of the school year after holidays, a change from middle school to high school. So, you know, once a kid is in and being pushed to go in after two weeks, it self-corrects. Okay, fine. Now those kids may be a little bit at risk for problems. Parents have to pay attention to that, but that self-corrects. Acute school avoidance is where the youth is out for two full weeks in a row or more. And the more that they're out, the more, the longer they're away from school, the tougher it is to work with these kids. Just bear that in mind. Treatment is definitely indicated for these kids. And then finally, chronic is where you see kids, and we see a lot of them, and Tony has them in his day program. A lot of kids, they come to Q Card Mid Manhattan too, they're out for one calendar year and, or more. These are very difficult treatment resistant cases the longer they are out and as time goes on. And it often requires really multi systemic, multi levels of care for these youth. Now, last night at 11 o'clock, my husband told me that there's new data on school uh, absenteeism, which was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Many of you know and love him. And that is the first point on the slide here. Uh, that uh, nationwide, what has been reported is that from Thomas D., uh, an investigator in, at Stanford's education department, 
is since the pandemic. If we look at data from 2019, 18, 19, about 14.8 percent of kids in the U.S. were absent. But this is almost doubled, nearly doubled now uh, for the years 21, 22. 28.3% of students were chronically absent from school. Now, what percent of those kids are anxious, depressed, this heterogeneous group of internalizers versus all other reasons for school avoidance is something that has to be dug further into. And by three in the morning, I had given up. I'm going to look at that data later. But it's something to be mindful about. And what we really have to take note and understand, what we're going to be talking about clinically today in the way that we treat kids, it is for these kids who come into our clinics who can be identified. We could do things in school-based mental health clinics with them because they're showing up and they can get services. But there's so many social determinants of health that interfere with and impact school attendance. And so everything from poverty to um, the schools not having resources, for agencies and, and for counties not having resources. There's one time I gave a, a school uh, avoidance workshop in Miami for Miami-Dade um, uh, school counselors and such. Their caseloads, some of them had 1,500 kids on a caseload for one school counselor. So even just to meet the needs of any of the kids who are avoiding in systems is overwhelming. So we'll have to see what these data break down to. But we know that you know uh, what school avoidance, we see it very early, five to six years of age when they have to go to kindergarten all day long. This is where the early onset occurs. Um, the middle school kids are tough. This is where we see another rise in prevalence for those kids. And remember, developmentally challenges are happening here that are greater than what they've been used to of one class, one teacher, you're changing classes and so forth. And then when high school hits again, all the, all the homework, all the expectations, you're supposed to be more adult-like now, heading to college, yada, yada. Um, this is where, again, we see a real hit on, and spike of kids refusing school. And here, there's much more absenteeism. The parents can't pick those kids up and just bring them in. And so this is where, when they get stuck of avoiding school in high school, then you know we have lots of challenges. Want to add something? Talk Oh, yep, I'm going to roll. Yeah. Keep me going. Okay. Short-term consequences that we look at. You will see kids, they start with somatic complaints and they feel somatic complaints. I've walked many kids to, the, to school to bring them in for exposure-based work and we have vomited along the way. It happens. It's real. Um, and a lot of other things. But over time, the short-term consequences are in this calendar year, let's say, falling behind on school performance and homeworks and such. It disrupts their activities. They don't get to interact with others, socialize with others, um, get involved in things in the school. Again, like I said, the conflict that happens. And sometimes what we have had referred are parents who are hard with uh, physical punishment for their kids not attending. So there's all different ways that things can go awr awry. Um, and then the big thing for these kids is feeling so different from their peers and not being able to get back in. What do I say? What are they going to think of me? Everybody makes stories up now. All kinds of stuff goes around while I'm not there. Um, the long-term consequences are really severe. And I've had kids, Danny Pine and I have shared cases of kids in the past and other psychiatrists here. We've shared cases where we couldn't get the kids back in and the long-term uh, look at those kids are they don't wake up one morning and decide to get a GED and go to college or get into the workforce. It is really hard to turn it around. And so unstable histories over time, more dependency on family, social services and such, and they start self-medicating some of these kids with alcohol abuse and such. So we got to watch out for what goes on, including the anxiety and depression. Yeah. The only thing I would add there, just to piggyback Anne Marie's point, is that what we see with school avoidance, which makes it so challenging, is that there's usually some primary uh, reason or reasons that leads to the school avoidance, and then there are cascading challenges that build from there. So let's say there's a child who stops attending school for a particular reason, then all of a sudden a mountain of work builds up, and so then that work that is due becomes another barrier to getting a child back to school. And they've been separated from their peers, and so as Emery said, the, one of the biggest fears is what am I going to say to all the kids who have been, where have you been for the last month? How do I handle that? We're dealing with a lot of socially anxious youth here. So that's a particular challenge. Not to mention that sleep schedule often also mm -hmm. gets disrupted. And then I think, we, you know, many of us know the challenges when a kid's sleep schedule gets reversed, how, how difficult it can be for getting them up uh, and off to school. So 
it just points to really the identification early on and managing early on before we get to that more acute level of school refusal. And I will just caution one other thing that isn't written about much in the literature, but we do see, this is anecdotal, but we've seen a number of cases where uh, school avoidance occurs not just in one child, but in several in one family. So it's something, and when you can imagine if it's hard for parents to manage one child going in, the younger kids, you know, sort of tag along as time goes on. So it's something that's pretty insidious in the families too. There's a multi-tier model that Chris Carney and his colleagues have articulated uh, for intervention for problematic school attendance for absenteeism. You know, starting with universal interventions um, where depending upon the school resources and climate and such, you can have interventions that are occurring at the level of the school, uh, being socially and culturally responsive to kids who are having adjusting to school situations that are different for them, um, having act activities. And we, we always recommend this, especially for some of our kids who are starting a new school or getting back to school after um, summer breaks and things is orientation activities, getting to know the school, the teacher, other kids and so forth. Um, so a lot of dropout prevention programs and stuff are, are in place around the country in various places. Targeted interventions, the next tier up, of course, this is where our school-based mental health services come in to play um, because they're right there. They can intervene as the teachers start reporting who's leaving class very more often, who wants to, who's missing, who's crying a lot. Um, and these are psychological approaches, CBT and other kinds of interventions that can be done in the school, but also working with families. When you get to tier three, these are the youth um, with severe absenteeism, and these are the kids who need a higher level of care. A day program like our CDU here at PI, Tony's uh, intensive program up at Terrytown, or residential schools um, that are clinical and such. These are the kinds of things that we might have to do, um, but definitely intensive case management that is a multi-system, multimodal approach to treatment. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just say what I like about this model is for those who work directly with, with our school systems, uh, school staff understand very well this multi-tiered approach. And so we'll do a lot of work with schools thinking, what are those tier one interventions? What are the interventions we can put in place on a school level to really help prevent school avoidance from building out? Things like attendance tracking. What, you, you know, how is attendance tracked in the school? And what's the follow-up if a child misses three days or is late five or six days in a row? What is the follow-up there and how can we kind of swoop in early and provide support to a child or a family? Or, you know, bringing our nurses and our nursing staff in schools up to speed. Nurses are usually, they can tell you probably better than anybody, who are the kids with anxiety and at risk for school avoidance? Because a lot of these anxiety concerns present somatically. Um, so thinking about these tier one approaches goes very much in line with how schools are thinking about, you know, managing social emotional learning. Um, and, and it's kind of speaking their language. And don't forget the cafeteria staff and the librarians, because they actually see a lot of kids with school avoidance uh, in, in their areas. And so it's been really cool to work with some schools who have trained all of their staff in how to recognize the kids who are in need. So just quickly on the data for interventions, when it comes to psychosocial interventions, let me just say this uh, to start off. It's tough getting an NIMH grant for school avoidance work. I'll just, uh, Gail Bernstein is the person who's been able to do it, um, but otherwise it's really hard to get a clinical trial and, um, funded. And part of the reason why is because of the heterogeneity. When your outcome is school attendance, that's what the real primary outcome is for these studies. But what you're trying to capture and treat is underlying depression, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, separation, various things going on. It's really, really difficult. And review committees, at least historically, haven't liked <laughs> to fund these projects. So a lot of work is done with foundation or just you know in psychology departments when it comes to the psychosocial treatment development where they've been people's dissertations such as Chris Carney and others that um, are unfunded work. But nonetheless, you know anxiety or others uh, other um, conditions are secondary outcomes, usually symptomatic level, not disorder level. And you know there's really in looking over the whole data, there's six psychosocial treatment studies. Uh, two, the Bernstein ones that involve medication plus the psychosocial treatment. 
um, that uh, Maynard et al. All had looked at in a meta-analysis. Alternative treatments were in four of these, weightless, no control, uh, no treatment control in two. And essentially the treatments that were being evaluated in these open trials and also some very small randomized controlled trials, when you look at them, was CBT with parent training, individual CBT, some behavior therapy with parent and teacher training, um, or Rogerian was one study was Rogerian group therapy. So, and the numbers of sessions varied greatly. Now looking here at Hedges G for what favored treatment, the treatment group versus what really favored the control condition. You know, we see in general that giving treatment, psychosocial treatment for school avoidance behavior, for getting kids back in, you know, you see some benefit in that. So you gotta give them something is essentially what we take to help them get back into school. I'll just say, you know, most of these trials are four to eight weeks, okay? Uh, the effects on anxiety, mixed. Because again, anxiety isn't the main focus. It's getting back in. And so you have mixed results when it comes to anxiety. You have um, Neville King and Cynthia Lass, two major uh, CBT people from the 90s who did their work um, that showed, okay, you know, they could get them in and the anxiety gets reduced. But the caveat here with the psychosocial treatments the literature, there's no long-term follow-up. I mean, in some of them, there's a couple of, you know, months post, you know, acute treatment, but really there's no long-term follow-up. There's a lot of methodological problems. We really need to do some kind of real good, you know, study um, and see what's going on. So we don't know. We do know that CBT in general is helpful, but we need a good trial. Medication isn't uh, faring much better, <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, primary, primary outcomes, again, are mostly school attendance here. You had much more of a look at the secondary outcomes on levels of anxiety and depression in kids. And in a recent systematic review by a group at Yale, what we see, they evaluated six articles. Um, one of the articles had two trials in it. This is Gail Bernstein, who did an open trial with alprazolam, um, and amipramine, you know, comparing alprazolam to amipramine. And then she had a second trial that was a RCT in that paper. And you look, they've evaluated alprazolam, amipramine with and without CBT, um, clomipramine versus individual therapy versus placebo plus individual therapy, fluoxetine. This is Glenn Melvin in um, Australia, fluoxetine plus CBT versus CBT plus placebo. Um, and you would think that's a great study. Unfortunately, it was very low N. Uh, and then another fluoxetine uh, plus CBT versus CBT. And it, in general, again, we had very you know mixed methodological problems here and flaws, mostly small Ns. There were some older gen you know medications, and we know like difficulties with amipramine side effects and stuff to be mindful of. The bottom line too is that adding fluoxetine to CBT didn't really improve on school attendance as compared to CBT alone. Uh, there wasn't a significant difference. So again, what we're left with is what do we do? S medications absolutely are helpful and need to be a part of the, the uh, treatment plan. We especially look at working with parent and child for understanding the severity of illnesses in terms of starting with meds and CBT or starting with CBT alone, but we need systematic study of this over time. We will leave that and now talk about what do we do? How do we treat? So I got to say, it's here, it's yeah. live. Highly recommend co-presenting with Anne-Marie. <laughs> Makes my job so much easier. Um, but in, in case it's not abundantly clear yet, but treating school avoidance is very, very hard. And I know I'm looking at the, the CDU folks and other folks out there. Um, it, it is quite challenging work. Um, I'm thinking about our team at the Anxiety Day program and how hard they're working every day, um, you, you know, because every day is, an, is a new challenge um, and, and uh, just putting out fires left and right. But we'll, we'll get to that part. Um, but, you know, what's not necessarily so hard about it um, it's not that the therapeutic interventions are necessarily overly complicated or hard to um, understand. Many of the interventions we're using for school avoidance are the ones that many of us have learned in training to treat anxiety, to treat depression, to treat oppositional behavior in youth. 
Um, you know, what makes it challenging is, is number one, just the sheer acuity of the problem. I mean, when, we, when we're thinking about school avoidance at its core, it's really um, a severe manifestation or symptom of anxiety and or depression that's then resulted from months, if not years, we're talking about of a child learning these avoidant behaviors related to school. And then the systems around that child reinforcing and accommodating uh, that avoidance. Um, which brings us to the second challenge that uh, to be successful and be effective in treating school avoidance, you can't just work with a child or teen. Um, you can't have a once weekly session with a kid and give them some skills and tell them, hey, here's the plan for getting to school next week. See you next Wednesday and hope for the best. You know, tried it, doesn't work <laughs> as a novice therapist. Um, you really do need to engage the family system in a very meaningful way. As a clinician and treatment team, you need to uh, engage the school system and you need to be thinking very carefully about how those different individuals and systems work with each other and relate to each other. So, you know, in other words, how does the child and caregiver or caregivers um, relate with regarding the child with regards to school avoidance? How how do those relationships go? How do caregivers connect and interact with each other? regarding a child's school avoidance? Are, are caregivers on the same page in terms of the messaging about getting to school? Um, or is there conflict or some dif difficulties that then gets in the way of helping a kid attend school regularly? What are the interactions between child and parents and the school system? And are child and, and caregivers able to kind of engage with school staff and with school representatives in a meaningful way? Or you know, are there difficulties there? Are parents, for whatever reason, feeling like they can't really align with school or ally with school to help their child? Are there other difficulties? Are parents or caregivers just not able to kind of find the bandwidth given everything else going on in their lives to kind of work there? And how do school staff work with each other and connect with each other to kind of send a consistent message about managing anxiety or mental health concerns and helping a kid get there? Um, and we're not even talking about broader school climate uh, issues, issues related to bullying or peer difficulties or larger community climate. Um, so, you know, it's just so important to be thinking about all of these different systems when assessing and, and, and treating school avoidance. Um, and, and Lyon and Kotler in their work provided this really helpful model, kind of to what we're speaking about, um, of a multi-systems approach to treating school avoidance. Um, and that effective treatment really requires intervention at these different levels. And so I would just encourage folks to be thinking about, you know, when, when considering school avoidance, how are we operating at each of these levels from the microsystem level, which is what are those interventions directed specifically towards a student or child or specifically towards caregivers, as well as what are those mesosystem interventions, uh, which are really meant towards like connecting the different individuals or systems, building engagement between parents and school personnel, for example. Um, and then at the exosystem level, more broadly, how are we addressing uh, you know, broader issues related to school climate, related to child safety and welfare and, and uh, you know, mental health supports within and, and around the school and, and community? Um, but thinking about all these systems at play, it could be, it could be really hard to know where to start treating these acute cases of school avoidance. Um, you know, what I try to keep in mind and what I've learned from working with Anne-Marie for so long, you know, is just a simple phrase of find the functions. You know, what are the functions that are driving that school avoidance behavior? What are the, you know, what are the main drivers of a child not getting to school that might be individually or, or family based? Um, you know, and Anne-Marie along with um, Christopher Carney um, developed what's known as the school refusal assessment scale, um, which besides giving us an overall measure of severity for school avoidance, really nicely um, categorizes school avoidance behavior into four primary functions um, and uh, you know, gets a parent and caregiver, uh, I'm sorry, a parent and student report in terms of really what's driving, what's contributing to that school avoidance behavior and I'll let Anne-Marie walk through those functions right now since uh, yeah, she's been me, doing this work for decades. So let me just correct the record. Chris Carney was a student of Wendy Silverman's at SUNY Albany. And so for those of you who have done dissertations like myself and Tony, I mean, my dissertation has been collecting dust for forever and ever. It was like one and done. Let's go. Now I'm a PhD. Yay. 
Chris, though, Wendy Silverman had him working, and he he was interested in school avoidance. And he had worked in the area of autism spectrum, looking at what a, the be, what's the function of a behavior, whether it's self-harming or whatever it might be, what's the function of a behavior for a child? And so in thinking about school avoidance, he was like, what function does this behavior of staying home serve for the child? And they developed the school refusal assessment scale, which allows the kids to answer. It's 24 items. They go through the parents answer based on their observation of the kid to determine what's going on here that is driving the school avoidance. Uh, where's the, there we go. And so he came up with this functional model. And what's important about this functional model is again, when you thought of the term school phobia, just you think about fear. When you think of school refusal, you think about willfulness, but really what he was looking at is there, and, and his research has shown his dissertation turned into his career and he is like the king of school avoidance is that kids are, who are internalizers are ref refusing or avoiding school for two main reasons. One is driven by negative reinforcement. They are either avoiding function number one or those who avoid because when they're at home, they feel better and they get relief from their worry from generalized anxiety. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to pass this year. What if the teacher doesn't like me and then she grades me hard and what? From their separation, of, I'm sorry, from their um, panic and fear of having panic attacks in class, from their phobias of not wanting to hear the school alarms going off, the fire drill and what have you. From nowadays, being afraid of school shooting. All right, so when they're at home and, when, and the depressed kids here, Everybody is getting together, making plans, uh, what they're going to do. And the depressed kids are like, what's the point? No, I'm not interested and nobody likes me. So being at home relieves them of those heavy emotions. Secondarily is, or, or the uh, uh, function number two, are the socially anxious kids. In school, they are constantly biting their nails. Like, when is this class going to be over? When can I get out of here? I mean, we could talk about social anxiety forever because this is like one of the main anxiety disorders. And it's the disorder that if it's in a diagnostic picture, it predicts not responding to treatment, no matter the CAM study, TADS, all of them. So two functions, negative reinforcement. When I'm at home, I feel better. It reinforces me wanting to stay home. Then comes two more functions that are based on positive reinforcement. What happens to a parent whose little one is, mommy, I don't want to go to school. I love you. I can't go to school. I miss you. Separation anxiety demands a lot of parental attention. Those of you who have raised children, come on, when they start begging to be with you and do things. And I actually had a patient whose child was school refusing and the mother was in her own therapy and the mother's therapist said, well, it's obvious your daughter feels you're going to abandon her if she, when she goes to school. So just keep her home here and there and take her out and go shopping and go to museums. It's like, oh, mama mia, that just solidified the school. But she got a lot of attention. It's, it, it's so separation anxiety. You get a lot of positive attention, not necessarily positive, but attention from parents. And then finally, over time, whether you start out with function one, two or three, when you're at home and you don't have to go in and you get to eat Ben and Jerry's for breakfast and you could go online when you want and blah, 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 you get a lot of positive reinforcement. So these functions now with the school of refusal assessment scale allows us to start zeroing in on what's the motivating conditions because we're gonna treat each, whatever they fall on, we're gonna treat them with different CBT techniques. Back to you, Tom. Yeah, no, and we've got the we've got the therapeutic toolbox at our disposal, really, and and that's why it's important when thinking about school avoidance. Yeah, you know, having some understanding of the different treatments for child and mental health uh, concerns, because you know a, a school refuse a school avoidance case may require a whole lot of exposure treatment or a whole lot of like behavior activation. If there's more of a depression profile, we may be focusing much more on doing parent and caregiver work, depending on a child's motivation and willingness and the role that parents and caregivers play. Um, so if you look here, like these are a lot of the treatments we're doing with a lot of the kids, not to mention, you know, we don't have the medication front here, which Anne-Marie spoke to, and we're thinking about, you know, SSRIs versus like everything else. And the other piece that we haven't mentioned yet is also, identifying any kind of learning problems that may be undiagnosed and have not um, been properly addressed. So, you know, understanding these functions is so crucially important. And just to kind of um, like flesh it out a little bit, imagine you have a 10 year old female 
who has social anxiety, a lot of fear of rejection, contributing to staying away from peers, not wanting to kind of be around her, be around kids at school, stays on the periphery of the playground, um, and ultimately stops going to school because she's feeling rejected, because she's having a lot of difficulty socially and is afraid of, and we see this all the time, I have no one to sit with at lunch. I'm not even going to put myself in that scenario. Um, it's, it's the worst, and I'd rather stay home, and I don't care about going to school. Um, and you have parents who, as Anne Marie's laying out, very helpfully trying to kind of reinforce, you know, trying to help a child get to school, but may knowingly or unknowingly be reinforcing that avoidance. Um, think about if you have a child who's, you know, refusing to get out of bed with the, you know, with the covers up over her head, um, you know, most well-meaning parents may, you know, sit down and give a back rub for a little while, help a child calm down maybe bring breakfast in bed for a teen, maybe bring coffee. And it's just kind of feeding into the, you know, that positive reinforcement, that attention seeking. So in a case like this, you know, we really are thinking about what are those child-based interventions for this young girl? It may be CBT for anxiety, a whole lot of kind of exposure therapy and CBT for social anxiety, while also working with caregivers to understand ways in which they might be accommodating and reinforcing that avoidance and putting a clear and consistent plan together to help uh, reinforce attendance and then working very closely and carefully with the school to have a clear plan in terms of expectations and to, to follow through with that plan. And we'll go over more of the details you know, in a minute. Um, but you know the functions are very much driving these interventions. Now, let's say that child has no interest in coming in, and we see this all the time. We're dealing with anxious, avoidant kids. You think they love coming to therapy? We're like the you know we're we're almost just as bad as school. Um, so a lot of the work is just kind of helping to engage our kids who are school avoidant, and even in the treatment process. And sometimes that is a long play. And so the interventions that we're thinking about much more readily up front have actually little to do with the child. We might be doing some motivational work, helping them engage, but the real meat and potatoes is working with caregivers to, you know, to change their behavior and help a kid get to school more consistently and help get in the, you know, manage whatever's getting in the way of that child getting to school while also continuing to work with school. So where our teams are constantly thinking about these spheres, which interventions are fitting in these spheres and how do they relate together? Um, Anything to add before we get into some of the nitty gritty? You're on it. All right. Um, so treatment, we're going to talk kind of in three kind of pillars, kind of our there's three spheres we were talking about. <laughs> I know I like this picture. Um, what are our child or student based interventions? What are our caregiver interventions? And what are our school based interventions? Um, for with kids, a lot of what we're trying to do up front is give a lot of psychoeducation help kids understand, and kids can understand this, like what is that role between anxiety and avoidance? What's the association between depression and withdrawal or avoidance as well? And what are those immediate and longer term impacts of avoidance on anxiety and mood? Um, and why is it, you know, what's the rationale? What are their reasons for getting back to school? Which kind of brings us to our next place. Um, we've gotten a lot of leverage um, particularly as we've built it more and more into our treatment program um, in, in our Westchester clinic of really focusing on values and really thinking, helping a child think about what are the things at school that matter to you? Yeah, work stinks. Yeah, your teacher's, you know, grumpy and is, is a pain in the neck and you don't want to be there. But what gets you there? Like, is it showing up for your sports team to be a good teammate? Is it that you and your friends love to talk about, you know, this Netflix show at lunch and you like to be a part of that? Is it that you, you know, for some of our older teens, they can connect with the idea of, I see myself as an honest person and a conscientious person, and I know that's the thing I'm going to do, or I'm a good family member, and this is how, you know, this is how I contribute. Um, so whatever those values are, really kind of like tapping into those, because they make the hard work worth it. And we try to really kind of like, you know, leverage and underlay that in all the work we're doing. Um, but we're also kind of helping kids think flexibly in other ways, um, from more of like, you know, all the way from kind of Aaron Beck and, and to hear like, how are we responding? How are we cognitive restructuring? Are there, um, you know, ways that we can help a kid think more flexibly? And also from kind of a more of a um, uh, acceptance place, can we make space for our anxiety instead of fighting it? And can we kind of, um, can a kid kind of use cognitive diffusion or acceptance cognitive techniques to then help them 
uh, move forward. So we're thinking about how to how to help kids think a little bit more flexibly, um, but certainly for uh, you know our anxious kids, which I'd say are the vast majority, there's some anxiety in almost all the school avoidance cases we're working on. Um, we're focusing on exposure-based interventions, and we're doing this in the office. We're doing this out of the office in our day program. There we are constantly kind of thinking about what are the exposures they're doing um, in our program and at home. But we're also thinking of what are exposure to the school setting. So you know we're thinking about you know can you go in and after school if you're really terrified of seeing kids uh, during the school day to to go and just walk through the school building just to familiarize yourself and deal with the anxiety that that might bring up can you send an email to a teacher just so let you know just to say hi and and connect and we work with kids to think through what are the things they're avoiding based on their fears based on that functional assessment to really build out an exposure plan and to really hammer home the idea that we want to help kids learn to tolerate their anxiety um, instead of instead of push against it and that it's not dangerous um, yeah, if I could also add here, one of the things if, um, to know is when a child is referred or a teenager is referred, we're, from the beginning, we want them to know we're there to help them get back to school. We don't want there to be any thought that, you know, we're on their side to stay home, we're their buddy to help convince their parents, no. So, you know, and this, believe me, they want that. They'll you know, they do all kinds of stuff to convince us on that. Um, or get me homeschooling and such, because quite frankly, they refuse that once, once the parents have gotten it for them. But a big thing here is that whether we're looking at anxiety, depression, or the mix, and whether you, we call it exposure or behavioral activation, the idea is to help them get in touch with the things that they are avoiding, uh, whether it's depression, driving that avoidance because it doesn't feel good to go to school and be around the other kids. We gotta get them in there so that they start uh, bringing in the cognitive, having some hypotheses about and testing the waters. What actually will happen if you experience what you have been avoiding? If you experience the lunchroom, if you experience sitting in a class, if you experience going to an extracurricular activity, whether it's anxiety will drop over time or your mood will improve. This is what exposure and behavioral activation are all about. And we can start small. One of the things we hope to do over time, and this is where virtual reality comes in, we have a virtual classroom and things like that. Any way we could get the kids in touch of dealing with and being immersed in a situation that feels as real as possible, the day program, the CDU, feels like a school setting that they are going to generalize to their home, their actual school, is what we are aiming for. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just to kind of give a graphic, this is how we, this is often how we kind of explain to our kids. And these are graphs that kind of, you know, co colleagues made. Um, and in fact, our post last year had, had this one kind of framed in her therapy office. But just to kind of really bring this idea along to kids that the more you're trying something, the easier it's going to become, right? And we point to what are all the different things we're doing all the time that become easier. Um, we did grand runs once before. This one's a little bit easier than the first one I did. Um, next one in 20 years might be a little a little bit easy. We'll see, better not. <laughs> um, but what are experiences in a child's own life that they can relate to? Whether it's, you know, riding a bike, riding a subway, showing up to, you know, someplace else for the first time, meeting a kid who becomes their friend for the first time. How do we kind of bring this idea uh, around and then leverage that to help engage kids in exposure work? And I'll be totally honest. Um, it's a minority of kids who come into treatment saying, yeah, you know what, Dr. P, Dr. Aldano, I will, you know, do that. Let's do that exposure therapy thing. The kids don't want to be there often. Um, some of them, though, a fair amount of them are, would love to be back in school and just don't know how. They're just stuck and they feel so terrified about kind of moving forward that they're literally frozen. Um, and then of course, as we've been discussing, there are a lot of kids who may not have the insight into kind of the, you know how challenging this is and their motivation is low, or maybe there's a small part of them that wants to be back at school, but a much larger part of them is connecting with, I just can't. Um, and so thinking about those kids um, is where we focus on our other interventions. I will just say really briefly, we're not gonna go through all these, but these are exposures we're doing a lot with our school avoidance kids. With our socially anxious avoid, school avoiders, we're 
helping them think through what's that first day back. What's going to be your stock answer when kids are coming up to you in the hallway? Where have you been? Oh, I heard you've got this. I've heard blah, blah, blah. Um, what's your, what's going to be your answer? And sometimes it's general and sometimes it's mind your own business. And, um, you know, we role play that and we practice that. We also deal with other social anxiety exposures. Um, we see a lot of kids who really um, have a lot of perfectionistic beliefs and somewhat counterintuitively, these are the kids who work super duper, duper, duper hard overwork and then burn out by the time they're in eighth grade. And so they're not going to school because they fall behind and they can't bear not doing work perfectly or not being perfect. So we help, we do a lot of imperfection exposures. Um, Anne Marie spoke to some of our separation anxiety exposures. And then we see a large swath of kids and teens where uh, there's either coexisting medical conditions or they're experiencing a lot of like somatic symptoms of anxiety, oftentimes GI distress, oftentimes migraines or headaches. Um, and a lot of the work there is helping them learn to tolerate and make space for uncomfortable physical sensations. Um, so these are this is often like the, the work that we're doing. And I think one of the things that we've learned, I mean, what's great about, again, this CDU and Tony's um, program up in Westchester is when you get kids in groups or get them into a, a program that has other kids who also have school avoidance or other kinds of anxiety or depressive issues, they're working together. These exposures come to life or behavioral activation tasks come to life because they're doing this with kids who look like them in terms of age and stuff, right? And, and this is important because we can't recreate classroom or go into their classroom necessarily. This is also where school-based mental health comes in because they could pull a group of kids who are having anxiety together into, you know, and doing things in the counselor's office and stuff. It's so important for exposure and behavioral activation to make sure that we are really getting at the cues in the environment that are very much like the cues that they have to experience in coping in school. The classroom has to look like a classroom. The teacher has to sound like a teacher and can't be a therapist just role-playing necessarily. Other kids have to be other kids and not you know, your graduate student externs who are role-playing being 15 years old again. It's things like this, the more credible we could be. And a lot of times this is why we bring our kids out of the office. We go to libraries to do things, uh, Whole Foods, they hate us because we're doing a lot of social anxiety exposures there, all kinds of stuff. You know, So you've got to get the cues of the environment really and the situation to be salient in order for exposure and behavioral activation to take hold. Yeah. Um, just moving on from working with kids to working with, with their caregivers. Um, and I'll... I've said often, if I could, if I have only one of these spheres to work with, um, I'm going to prioritize working with caregivers because usually you can get the most bang for your buck kind of helping parents think through how are we shaping behavior at home and, and working with schools to get, to get our kids back. Um, so, you know, working with caregivers whenever possible is, is so important and so crucial uh, for a number of reasons uh, to provide support to them you know, a lot of times caregivers who are dealing with school avoidance have been through the ringer for years, having kind of the experience of trying to get their kids to school, oftentimes feeling pressure from uh, extended family members. Say, well, why just get them in the car and go? And they don't understand kind of the true nature of how difficult it is um, getting calls from school. Just, you know, the, the daily calls of, hey, so-and-so is not here again. And what are we doing about this? Um, and a lot of times caregivers are also managing many other demands, whether they're work demands, whether they're other children, um, you know, other family members. And so providing support to caregivers for children with school avoidance is, is crucially important. Um, we also want to be thinking about how are we modifying their approach to avoidance, as we've talked about before, adjusting the home environment to make sure that there's not easy access to, you know, the iPad and the TV and, you know, whatever else makes home really reinforcing. Um, and then really trying to build a more collaborative and, and engaged relationship between family and school. And there could be a lot of reasons why that might be fractured. Um, and, and it could be for a number of reasons. There's a lot of finger pointing when families first come in. It's the school's fault. We asked for a different teacher, blah, blah, blah. The school is pointing fingers at the parents. We tried this, we tried that, blah, blah, blah. So it's helping to get everybody on the same page. And also within, just within the family, yeah. you know, we could have a drill sergeant parent and we could also have a very, you know, you know, overprotective parent and working in the same home. The big thing is pointing everyone towards what do you actually want for this child? 
whether we're talking to mom, dad, abuela, you name it, what do you actually want for this child? And they want the child to be able to be successful, get to school. So we have to help them see that whatever they're doing, and the same thing with the school maybe, whatever you might have been doing hasn't been working. So let's put our heads together for a plan that really everybody can get on board with and do this plan consistently. Because a big thing for caretakers is inconsistently. Parents can like be hardline for a little bit, but then they get tired, they give up, fine, stay home. What do we know about intermittent reinforcement? It's what keeps casinos open. Absolutely. And a lot of times parents are coming in and I'm sure clinicians out there have heard it before. We've tried all of the plans before, you know, we've tried behavior plans. So, you know, we don't want to go that route, but it is, it's, it's the following through. And we'll usually say this work needs a ton of patience and a ton of persistence because you really have to kind of see kids through that wave of kind of pushing back and extinction. Um, but the main skills we're often thinking about with caregivers Consistency we talked about, having a plan that parents can follow through and support each other with. Distress tolerance is a big one. Um, we know that kids who have anxiety are more likely to have parents who have anxiety. And these parents oftentimes find it hard to kind of manage the stress of kind of pushing a child. Um, and so helping parents find a way that they feel comfortable, that they can kind of get behind, you know, tolerating their child's distress about going into school and facing whatever's there and their own distress around like, uh oh, what if we're pushing too hard? What if, you know, what if that stomach ache really is something and it's not just anxiety and we should be going to the GI specialist to get that figured out? Um, you know, so helping parents learn to kind of hold their own distress in the service of getting their kid back to school and then reducing any accommodation of avoidance, finding those ways in which parents might act that. Uh, that really reinforce avoidance. And I'll just add here too, we have a parent uh, group, five session parent group that we run as part of our emerging adult program at the cue cards. Mm -hmm. And a big part of this group, these are parents oftentimes whose kids have not wanted to go to therapy. They're 18 to 20 something, but extending it down and doing this with our high school age, parents of high school age kids. A big thing for them is when they get in a group and they see other parents struggling with the same issues, it helps to address the shame and the guilt that they have been feeling for, oh my gosh, I have ruined my kid's life. Yeah. Um, and so this is this is important. Their over accommodating comes from a place of love. It really does. And they, you know, we want them to know you haven't done this to your kid. This is the way that it's gone over time, that the patterns and habits have emerged. We can do things differently. And getting the social support for the parents and group is so critical sometimes, so. Oh, that's a great point. Um, I, I put up a behavioral agreement slide. Has anyone ever had the experience of making a plan or saying something to a child, maybe your child, and then the next day, like, you never said that. That was never something that you, that you we, we never talked about this. Um, the behavioral agreements in place, this is something that we, we work with at caregivers to have in writing, what is a child's expectations on a daily and weekly basis? for school attendance, for managing, uh, you know, for whatever the plan is built with the treatment team, built with school for a child to get to school and, and participate in school. Um, and that we as therapists and a treatment team work very closely with the parent. And this is a working document. This is almost daily where this these expectations are changing. Um, but I highly recommend having something in writing, a written plan, not just for the child, but for school that can then be disseminated uh, so that everybody, uh, thinking about those systems, everybody in the system knows what's the plan and what's the expectation for a child. And if you have a child or teen who's really motivated and can in a meaningful way engage in this process, fantastic. Um, oftentimes that's not the case, but I always love to involve a child if they can. We have examples, by the way, of behavioral contracts you could use between parent and child just to know, because I actually have, I love the 16 page contract between a lawyer father and his <laughs> 12 year old daughter. Um, these don't fly. These do not fly. So please use the ones that we can give you. Just email us. One pagers are recommended. <laughs> it was um, beautifully written, I got to say. But then another really important piece is really kind of supporting caregivers and being advocates and sometimes being an advocate as a clinician for caregivers and for a child with a school setting. Sometimes that means kind of supporting parents or helping to kind of get uh, meetings on the board with the school, um, really helping them understand what their rights are for their student and, and within a school to get 
neuropsych testing, which every student has a right to, for a CSC meeting as appropriate, um, and communicating other, any other needs, um, which are, you know is is a, is a very helpful component as well. So we're really kind of carrying that advocacy role uh, in working with caregivers. Um, and then in terms of school-based interventions, on kind of our third speed sphere, um, our teams are working with schools almost daily. In fact, you know, we joke about sending flowers and chocolates to our school, you know, to the schools that we work with because, you know, we're calling almost daily. And a lot of times it's the school staff who are kind of meeting our kids in the, you know, outside of the school entrance or in the parking lot and really kind of partnering in, in really helpful ways. Um, but it's so important to work with, with the school to understand, you know, what, how can school be a support? What are barriers that the school is identifying? Um, and how can we set up supports? And a, and a you know, terribly important part of that is identifying a point person. Um, if there's any other New York Knicks fans out there, Jalen Brunson came to the Knicks and is like running their team right now. Um, we're always looking for like the Jalen Brunson in a school with school avoidance. Like who's going to be that point person for a child and for a family? Who is the school person who I'm going to call or email pretty much daily with updates and let them know, here's the plan. Um, that school point person is then going to be reaching out to other teachers, other school, other school staff to essentially be the liaison and is also like the person who's watching out for a child in the school setting, watching out for the family in the school setting. Um, without this point person, for our elementary school kids, a lot of times it's their classroom teacher. With a middle school or high school kids, oftentimes it's a social worker, or a psychologist, a guidance counselor. It doesn't really matter who, you know, there's no specialized training. It's just who is that person? who we can rely on and a family can rely on. Yeah, and we wanna be mindful that we don't necessarily want it to be the teachers because they're burdened as it is. So this has to be someone who can do the, you know, this job and we also have to keep it simple in terms of what our asks are. Mm -hmm. I'll let you take this one. <laughs> well, and then uh, this, uh, this actually is from a, uh, one of my niece's kids. She was having a little trouble going to school, little Sophie when uh, starting uh, first grade. And what was great about their school, and she was posted this on social media, so it was out in the public, uh, was great about their school is they had in their school a little group for the early childhood age kids or young kids uh, who are school avoidant for various reasons. And this was a tremendous support that when Sophie went in, uh, if she was having some difficulty, they did have these school, uh, these groups meet. Uh, the thing about it is another big part of this is that the school and the parents really are clear about a plan and working, you know, what is a, a plan that the parents can fulfill and also the school can fulfill and making sure the expectations are in line with what the child is doing and adjusting them if things go awry for some reason, you know, a child develops the flu and is out of school, a child who had been having difficulties attending, then they're, they're out of school, let's say for a full week, it's gonna be hard getting them back in oftentimes after that. Okay, so how do we adjust? What do we have to do? A little more contact, a little more uh, time with the teacher or uh, the point person. These are the kinds of things that have to happen. Um, but everybody has to be on board for sharing the plan and expectations. Yeah, we're also looking to build connections between school personnel and students and caregivers like we're talking about. Uh, Zoom's made this a lot easier. You know, I personally love to have a meeting with with the child or teen, along with parents, along with the treatment team, along with teachers. And I've had great experiences of a, of a child or teen being able to advocate for themselves and say things that they wouldn't necessarily say to a teacher in a classroom. But, hey, listen, I struggle a lot when there is a big assignment and this is when I get anxious and this is what helps me at school. And that can go a long way. So having kind of those meetings, if you know, with whoever's open to being there. Um, as well as thinking through what are the regular ways we're all going to stay in touch because with school avoidance cases, like I said before, so often the goalposts are changing kind of day to day. And we want to be, you know, we want to be meeting a kid where they're at while always kind of continuing to push towards more consistent attendance. Um, we also want to be thinking about as a kid's coming back to school, um, are there ways that we want to ease them in um, to help them get there? And so we'll hear a lot of times about accommodations that schools make, and some of them aren't great. Like I've heard about kids where just an entire marking period, entire year is just kind of excused because, uh, you know, because uh, dealing with avoidance or like a, a hard class has been taken off the docket for forever, or a kid doesn't have to go to lunch forever. And, 
you know, it makes it easier, but that's ty that type of long-term accommodating isn't all that helpful. However, if it helps a kid get back to school to know that you don't have to go to gym for the first week, and that helps you get in the door and start to acclimate, I'm all for that. And we always think about how do we ease those expectations very temporarily in the service of more consistent school attendance. Um, so, you know, it's, it's another way that we're working with the school just to kind of help that kid get there. Um, and then finally, along these lines, um, we, we talked about this some, assessing school climate. So, you know, there are some things that a school and a student and caregivers just can't address. If there's bullying happening, if a child feels unsafe at all in the school setting, if there's not enough kind of support for a child, um, how does the school environment really promote safety, respect, connection with teachers, academic growth? Um, and I just put up there, there are a number of scales that are available to assess this. Um, because it's something that more globally we're always thinking about as well. Um, we did talk a bit about attendance tracking, highly recommended. Um, and then, you know, just a lot of, you know, other factors in terms of all the ways that that school avoidance and treating school avoidance can be difficult. Yeah, one of the big things, and Tony talked about this here, and you know, already, but we can't stress enough when a youth falls behind on their work, we can treat, we, we bring on, you know, we're working collaboratively with the psychiatrist, the child's receiving the medication, their symptoms are improving, but what is a big cognition is I'm never going to be able to catch up academically. Yeah. This is huge for keeping kids out. And so this is something where we really have to work collaborative, collaboratively with the school to have a plan for that catch up, not to wipe out, as Tony says, the work from the year or the half a year that was missed, but how can it be made up in such a way, including through the summer, if need be, so this youth can stay on track? If their goal is they want to stay in the same class and you know uh, be promoted, but this is something that you know some schools differ on whether they're hardcore on this or not. So we have to be mindful of that. Another thing you want to be mindful of is developmental milestones. And this is, can this kid just do things that every other kid does? Work, wake up to an alarm clock, uh, make a sandwich for themselves. Because if they're not skilled just in normal developmental milestones because these things were swooped into the overprotection, then we also have some problems because they're different from the other peers. So we have to work on that too. Yeah, and I think just the last point that we're, we wanna make is that sometimes kids really do need an alternative school setting. Sometimes the work is really finding what's a setting that fits best for a child. It might be a smaller setting. It might be a more therapeutic setting. Um, we are incredibly lucky here to have uh, the very unique Children's Day unit, which, uh, you know, works wonderfully and is where I like really kind of like be, got to know how to treat school avoidance. Um, but having settings like that that can really acutely provide care for a kid who is severely anxious or depressed or needs that uh, short term kind of more therapeutic setting, as well as the work we're doing up in QCard Westchester to provide a short-term kind of therapeutic setting while helping kids uh, get back into school. So just a point that like sometimes kids really do need either a short-term fix or a longer-term school setting. And thank you to all of you for attending and to our collaborators and colleagues for all of their support and engagement over the years. Yeah, no, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces here. Thank you.